Football became an empire game spread by British soldiers and sailors across Europe, Africa and South America. But 15 years after the rules had been drawn up, football still hadn't made its way across the Irish Sea to Great Britain's oldest and nearest colony. That was left to a man travelling in the opposite direction. The game, I mean, really can be put down to one man, John McAleary, who travels from Belfast over to Scotland and was very entranced by the game, maybe the opportunities of the game. A long ago, which is fortunate for the rest of us who followed him, uh, liked what the football body saw, got talking with the officials there, and out of that chance meeting came the first game played in Ireland, an exhibition game between Caledonians and the leading Scottish club, Queen's Park. It's one of those kind of unique moments in sport where you really can see the geographical introduction of a game into the island of Ireland being the result of one man's journey, one man's kind of inspiration. There was something very interesting about McCleary's initial match, which always should ring a bell about being wary of the testimony of journalists. Uh, the report in the Irish Sportsman uh, laughed at the players going around butting at the ball like a pack of goats and said that this was a game that would never take off in Ireland. But John McAleary knew better. McAleary is different in the sense of he actually stays with it, that he's instrumental not just in introducing the game into Belfast, but actually in setting up the first club, Cliftonville. The following year, McAleary called a few friends together and they met in the Queen's Hotel in Belfast and they met in the bar appropriately enough to form the Irish Football Association. In November 1880, just two years after seeing the game for the very first time by accident, John McAleary helped found a new business venture, the Irish Football Association Limited. There were just seven clubs, mostly from here in the city and the surrounding towns. From the very start, Irish football was Belfast football. The rules were provided from the Scottish Football Association handbook. The Scottish Association gave them, I think, five pounds to buy a trophy for competition for the Irish Cup. And from that very modest start came the game of football to Ireland. The very idea of the way football is introduced is introduced into predominantly Protestant working class unionist strongholds. And that's where the game has its kind of real hard roots within Belfast, within the north. Yes, there's Catholic players, you know, there's a Catholic enthusiasm for the game, they're not, they're not kept out. But the strength, the kind of the strength of numbers, the strength of administrative domination lies with unionists, with Protestants. From an early stage, the IFA decided that it was not going to countenance Sunday play, not only by its teams, but by its members on an individual basis. And that works in the context if you're the predominant people who are following you are... Protestants, Presbyterians and so on, who are happy to play on Saturday afternoon after finished work, but because of their religious grounding won't play on Sundays. This reflected very much the Belfast orientation of the IFA and the Unionist and Protestant ethos. Belfast was the country's only real working class powerhouse. If football was going to spread out across Ireland, it needed to depend on different Victorian stalwarts. The middle classes and the army. Soccer spills down from Belfast to the urban south and to the east coast south by and large or to the garrison towns. Well of course it was a garrison game. How could it not be a garrison game? You look at the number of British soldiers who were stationed in Ireland at the time. It was inevitable that they formed teams, they laid out soccer pitches and they played against local teams and a team of British soldiers won the IFA Cup in the middle of the 1880s. And the game then spread of course into Dublin. The emergence of soccer in Dublin is much more broadly led by men from the universities and the public schools at Castleknock, Clongowes and from Trinity. These were gentlemen amateurs who saw paying people to play as a complete anathema. So we have this initial division between the gentlemen amateurs of the Leinster Association and the sort of hard-nosed professional businessmen of the north of the County Antrim Association and the IFA. For 10 years, no more than a handful of amateur clubs survived outside the province of Ulster, and they were left in no doubt who was really in charge. When the national side is selected, overwhelmingly they select northern players to represent Ireland. This is another bone of contention. 
players and officials in Dublin are convinced that they are not getting their just representation in the national side or indeed on the national governing body. Outside of Ulster, soccer struggles to capture the country's imagination, trailing behind rugby and even cricket. And to make things even more difficult, a new kid showed up in town. The Gaelic Athletic Association. Football progress in Ireland is completely transformed in 1884 because in 1884 the Gaelic Athletic Association is formed. It doesn't come out of nowhere of course. For 20 years previously Irish nationalists of different stripes, be it the church at the time, to Charles Parnell and the Land League and the radical Fenians in the Brotherhood are all thinking upon the same lines. If you're an Irish person with a sense of difference, you are in a way almost looking around for some conduit that will allow you to express your distinctive identity. The spread of cricket, uh, and to some extent the spread of soccer, uh, and certainly the spread of rugby, were seen as the spreading of the English ethos into a country which was resisting the idea of English domination, by whatever means. Clubs started to entice the best players with under-the-table payments. Some drifted across the Irish Sea, where the rewards were greater. Reluctantly, the IFA legalised professionalism in 1894, and Leinster followed suit 11 years later. Football was becoming more than just a game. Dublin saw the formation of Bohemians, Shelburne and the new Leinster Football Association. Big employers like Guinness and later Ford in Cork added soccer to their list of healthy staff pursuits. Soccer spread year after year in Dublin and gained in importance. You see that from the number of people who are attending matches, the number of clubs which are established, the number of pitches in the city and the dominance of soccer over GEA in Dublin uh, during this period is obvious. Around about 1905, 1906, the number of actual clubs registered in the Dublin area starts to exceed the number of clubs registered in the Belfast area and the Leinster supporters argue that this is the great balance of power shift but it's ignored from Belfast because they can say well actually the, the money, the professional game, the arteries that feed the financial heart of the game are all based in the north. So there is, I think, these constant recurring underlying problems between north and south. You cannot get away from the simple fact that the power base of the game of soccer in Ireland was Belfast. The majority of the clubs which won the Irish Football League and which won the Cup were based in Belfast. The professionalisation of soccer was driven by Belfast from the mid-1890s. You must remember that it was only after 1905 that the Leinster Football Association allowed professionalism. It led to Shelburne turning professional and winning the Cup in 1906. And that was a key moment in, in driving the development of soccer uh, in, in Dublin. But rugby was becoming the established game in private schools. And after a decade on the sidelines, the GAA was rejuvenating, as was nationalist fervour. The GAA changed after 1900 and it did so as a consequence of a rise in a new sense of nationalism born out of factors such as the Boer War and uh, growth in anti-imperialism. It's amazing when you look back at newspapers from the 1890s into the 1900s, is the regular way in which newspapers are denouncing soccer, they're denouncing rugby, they're denouncing cricket. These are the foreign games, and football really struggles with that. The GAA introduces a ban, and the ban is kind of critical for delineating kind of GA people from football people. That GA people are not allowed to attend the games, they're not supposed to watch the games, they're not supposed to play the games. GA members were told not to play four other sports, which were cricket, hockey, uh, rugby and soccer. And later, of course, it was added that you couldn't be a member of the British Army or the prison service. Rivalry between soccer and GA, or between Belfast and Dublin, was one thing. But political and sectarian animosity was another thing altogether. Unfortunately, football was hijacked to a degree by those with political agendas. With the advent of Belfast Celtic, a whole new dimension came to the law and order side of football. The nationals were on board in the football sense, 
suddenly football became the vehicle by which all the political differences now found a new platform. Around the time of the introduction of the Home Rule Bill, you see major divides in Belfast between Belfast Celtic and Linfield. Belfast Celtic being the Catholic club associated with the Falls Road, and Linfield, of course, being seen as being staunchly unionist, loyalist in its politics. Those two clubs clashed repeatedly, leading in 1912 to a stage of gunfire, a riot. There was a quote in one of the papers which said, this game marked the arrival of the curse of bigotry into the game of football. You are seeing a long history of sectarian violence. What you have are large crowds of fit young men on a Saturday afternoon at three o'clock being locked into an enclosure with lots of other fit young men who probably like them have spent one o'clock until quarter to three in a public house with 120 years history of animosity between them. So in a way, we'd be better off looking to explain not why sectarian violence occurred, but actually why it didn't occur every single Saturday afternoon from about 1892 up until 1920. The Home Championship was the world's first international football competition an annual tournament between the four nations of the United Kingdom. In later years, it was even treated as a qualifying tournament for the World Cup. The matches were by far the biggest games of the season, but in its 30-year history, Ireland had never won. It won the home championship, that is the championship between Ireland, Scotland, England and Wales for the first and only time in 1914 by beating England 3-0 and beating Wales and then drawing with Scotland to secure the championship. Not for the first time, real life and death got in the way of football. The game in Ireland would be changed forever, not just by those four years of war, but by six days of rebellion. The 1916 rising in Dublin didn't seem to have a major disruptive effect on the actual games being played. I think games were postponed for about a fortnight. And again, that makes sense when you consider that this was a genuine revolutionary movement. It wasn't just composed of Irish speakers and followers of the GA. It actually included people from almost all backgrounds. After the Great War and the Rising, there were no tensions on the pitch. That's because there were no games. Ulster teams only played within Ulster. The rest of Ireland was left to its own devices. To all intents and purposes, there were already two separate leagues on the island. Football was struggling to survive in the midst of such bitter conflict. The tension between the Leinster Football Association in Dublin and the Irish Football Association in Belfast was not so much a rift as a chasm. There was a meeting of the LFA where there was decided to canvass the clubs on the practicality of splitting with the IFA and going it alone. More than 100 senior clubs received a letter from the Leinster Association on Dublin's Abbey Street. Now the letter asked the clubs one simple question and it was this. Is it in the best interests of football that the association should continue its connection with the IFA? Which was a huge ask because it could potentially mean no official league, no official cup competition and no international call-ups for the club's players. The overwhelming opinion was that they should indeed uh, go their own way. In August 1921, months before the Anglo-Irish Treaty was signed and civil war broke out, the men of the Leinster Football Association made their move towards independence by creating the Football Association of Ireland. It was the only sport prepared to take the risk of going it alone in uncertain times. The Free State was standing up to the Empire and the new Football Association of Ireland was taking its own independent path. In a way, the very partition of soccer in Ireland allowed the Football Association of Ireland an opportunity to present itself as the emblem of the state. 
soccer offered an opportunity to present the idea of Ireland on an international stage. The state seeks out crutches to support itself on, to lend itself credibility, but also to steady itself and gain stability. Recognition was the key to survival, but there was no way on earth that the IFA in Belfast or the FA in London would recognise the new free state upstart. There was only one place to turn, an organisation that was barely a teenager itself, FIFA, the world governing body. And I think it's absolutely critical for the free state in 1922 that football announces itself. An independent island has become, in footballing terms at least, a reality. That was an aspect of Irish history that has been badly underplayed in terms of gaining recognition for, you know, what is that flag up there? Who are they? Oh, they're independent now. FIFA had recognised the Free State's existence and Belfast weren't one bit happy. The IFA are appalled the speed with which FIFA accepts the Free State into the footballing family. They lobby FIFA from day one not to recognise the Free State as a footballing entity. Uh, they lose that battle that FIFA's historically always been very good at recognising new nations and recognising them quickly. And what they do is, while they can't do anything about FIFA, is they work very, very closely with uh, the authorities in England, Scotland and Wales, the, if you like, the home nations, to exclude the free state. So that there is no matches between a Wales and a free state, or a Scotland and a free state, or an England and a free state. And God forbid there will never be, kind of in that mindset of the 20s, a fixture between Northern Ireland and the free state. The IFA in Belfast still had the right to call their team Ireland and could still pick players from the entire island. If you think about finance, if you think about the idea of winning, the most important games the Free State could play would actually be against those home nations to beat the old enemy. And you're going to get more people who are going to go and watch the Free State versus England than pretty much any other fixture you could imagine. And yet that was close to them. For simple financial survival, the new Football Association of the Free State needed to play games, so they decided, quite sensibly, to look for a compromise. The two associations from the North and the Free State would meet a number of times over nine years, initially in 1923 at the Lime Street Station Hotel in Liverpool, along with delegations from England, Scotland and Wales, Details of those meetings have only recently come to light. According to the minutes, the first meeting was called to straighten out matters regarding football in Ireland. The Free State delegation suggested this. Let's recognise both associations North and South, but in order for the whole of Ireland to take part in home internationals, the selection committee should be made up equally of Belfast and Dublin members and international games should be played alternately in Belfast and in Dublin. Now that was just not agreeable. Also Dublin were determined that the name Ireland not be monopolised by the body in Northern Ireland. They had voluntarily changed their name to the Football Association of the Irish Free State. So they suggested that the IFA change its name too perhaps to the Northern Irish Football Association. Now that certainly was not agreeable. The attempt at compromise failed. The status quo would remain. The IFA remained the Irish Football Association. Only they could call their team Ireland. And only they could pick players from the entire island. The Free State Association would be recognised but could only pick from the 26 counties and could not call itself Ireland and it could not take part in the home internationals. It was up to the Free State to find matches where they could. You know who were the only ones to offer? Glasgow Celtic. The only chance of the Free State getting a proper international game was the 1924 Olympics in Paris which was, of course, amateur, and that ruled out most of the best Irish players. So the Free State Association hit the streets. They put ads in papers, they asked for CVs, they asked their applicants to name their best position. And most importantly of all, they asked the question, can you take time off work to go to the Olympic Games in Paris? 
the Free State team went to France, beat Bulgaria and qualified for the quarter-finals. And after the games, the US Olympic team stopped off on their way home and played the Free State's first ever home international game. Just an amateur friendly, but a start. To be one of the grown-ups, to be part of the proper international game of football, the Irish Free State needed a full professional international. It took five years to come, but the call eventually came. On the 21st of March 1926, the team of the Irish Free State walked out onto a pitch in Turin to face Italy in their first full international match. It was a big moment for soccer in Ireland that the Football Association of the Irish Free State was given an international match. It was a big thing because, again, they were working against the power base that was the Football Associations of the United Kingdom, who were against this entirely. This match is opposed by many of the vested interests in the North because they see the Irish Free State seeking international recognition and much of the Belfast press simply dismiss dismisses the match as a Catholic conspiracy to try and uh, overturn British influence within the sport. The Italian brass band didn't know the soldiers' song, but Jack Ryder, the head of the Free State FA, had packed the sheet music. Then the Italian officials apologised that they didn't have an Irish tricolour, but the team had brought that too. They were well beaten, 3-0, but who cares? They lost the battle, but they won the war for the right to exist. There is that kind of psychological moment where 11 men dressed in green standing un underneath a stand where the, the Irish flag is flying in its glory. I think it was symbolically very important. Visual evidence matters. You know, you can look up and you can feel a surge of pride. You know, these are your 11 men in green who represent you, the nation. For a crowd in a ground, this is Ireland writ large. A year later, they played the return fixture here at Lansdowne Road. In the programme, the home team played not as the Free State, but as Ireland. Now that was going to ruffle a few feathers. So when in 1949 an Irish team calling itself Ireland arrived here in Liverpool to play England, it was a very big deal. It's a great day for the Irish. At Goodison Park, 50,000 see the soccer sensation of the season, England's first ever home defeat by a foreign team. This victory for Ireland on the 21st of September 1949 here at Goodison Park was a milestone on a fraught journey. In some ways, the FAI's struggle to create an independent football identity mirrored the struggle to establish the New Ireland after partition. Peter Desmond is tripped in the forbidden area and Scottish referee Mowat blows up for a penalty. The Goodison crowd is hushed as Con Martin takes the kick. Only just over the line. So just how did a team not even allowed call itself Ireland, a team shunned for so long, end up playing England on their home turf? and winning. One goal lead, error draw still further ahead when evidence Peter Farrell slams in number two. The journey wasn't easy. After 1921, the South needed to make some bold strides to cement independence. Huge steps needed to be taken before Ireland and its football team could take their rightful place in the world. In my broadcast on Christmas Eve, one of these steps was Eamon de Valera's 1937 constitution. Article 4 reads, The name of the state is ERA, or, in the English language, Ireland. This gave the FAI the right, as it saw it, to call its team Ireland. But the Irish Football Association in the North had other ideas. This emotional breakup with the IFA became more tense when the FAI used Articles 2 and 3, which claimed sovereignty over the entire island, as a basis on which to select players from the North. This resulted in an Irish solution to an Irish problem. You had the ridiculous situation of players appearing at Windsor Park on a Saturday, and on a Sunday you go down to Daly Mount and they were playing in Dublin. This meant that more than 30 individuals were actually capped by both associations and played for both teams called Ireland. 
This was a custody battle that would go on for many years. And when Dev's government introduced an entertainment tax, football could have no doubts about its place in the New Ireland. This was a tax levied on various aspects of the entertainment industry, but it included a levy on entrance tickets. However, the GAA was exempt. But football wasn't exempt. Its status as a professional sport made it subject to the tax, and this wasn't the only advantage the GAA had over football. You also see that much of the money that goes towards the improvements to Croke Park is essentially free state government money. And in return, the state gains a lot of credibility by associating itself with the GAA, which is a genuinely popular Irish institution. However, while official Ireland had a certain view of football and foreign games, individual sports people were more open. I do think that the fans even then had a much more relaxed attitude towards uh, crossing over than the associations themselves, and certainly than the GA had with the ban. And when Dev's government introduced an entertainment tax, football could have no doubts about its place in the New Ireland. This was a tax levied on various aspects of the entertainment industry, but it included a levy on entrance tickets. However, the GAA was exempt but football wasn't exempt. Its status as a professional sport made it subject to the tax, and this wasn't the only advantage the GAA had over football. You also see that much of the money that goes towards the improvements to Croke Park is essentially free state government money. And in return, the state gains a lot of credibility by associating itself with the GAA, which is a genuinely popular Irish institution. However, while official Ireland had a certain view of football and foreign games, individual sports people were more open. I do think that the fans even then had a much more relaxed attitude towards uh, crossing over than the associations themselves, and certainly than the GA had with the ban. De Valera himself was a rugby follower and made no bones about it. There's no shortage of stories about legendary GA figures who privately, you know, uh, supported or even attended soccer matches. One not so private example of this was President Douglas Hyde. One of the new president's first official duties was to attend an international soccer match between Ireland and Poland at Dalyman Park in 1938. The GAA didn't like this one bit. Hyde was a Gaelic scholar, a founder member of the Gaelic League, and a patron of the GAA. But after he attended this game, Croke Park showed him the door. Four hundred and eight years after Henry VIII was crowned the King of Ireland, era cuts its last link with Britain. Ireland declared itself a republic in 1948 and Wickham sought a return fixture on English soil. The English FA accepted but refused to call the team Ireland, instead calling them the FA of Ireland. And so it was that in 1949, 33 years after the Easter Rising and 27 years after partition, a team calling itself Ireland beat England 2-0 here at Goodison Park, but it still didn't quite have their respect. I think it's quite interesting how it reflects on the English, that the English have kind of quite happily forgotten that they got beaten by the Irish. The standard pub quiz question is, who are the first foreign team to beat England at home? The answer is always Hungary, five years later. By six goals to three, Hungary shatter the unbeaten home record England has held in 90 years of football. Having beaten England, there was now a sense that the national side had growing momentum. And when Scotland pulled out of the 1950 World Cup, an invitation was sent to Ireland to take their place. But when the FAI realised the cost of bringing a team all the way to Brazil, the offer was declined. Little did they know then, it would take another 40 years before Ireland would have the opportunity again. As the profile of Irish soccer rose, maybe FIFA began to tire of Irish solutions to Irish problems. They'd agreed first that the FAI and the IFA must only select from their own territories, and then they instructed the FAI to play as the Republic of Ireland and the IFA as Northern Ireland. It seemed the tug of war between North and South was finally over. The last Ireland side with players from North and South lined out against Wales in 1950.